what we've seen this go around is the need to distribute, to produce a lot of debt. Where did those checks come from? They came from the, the government. The government wrote the checks. But the government can't produce money. The central bank can produce money. So they, uh, the central bank had, got, had to print a lot of money to lend to the government um, to do that. And that's monetization. When you get at the late part of that cycle, where you're creating a lot more debt and then you're monetizing it, that's the end of a de- uh, that's near the end of a long-term debt cycle, and that produces its own set of problems. So, what tells us when we're nearing the end of that cycle? I mean, uh, just in recent days, including this week, we've seen the ten-year yield really shoot up. It's still at a modest number historically, but it certainly shot up very quickly. Is it an early warning sign that maybe we've pushed it a bit far on the stimulus yeah. side? Because goodness knows we've had a lot of stimulus. Yes, I think um, t- let's understand what's behind that. Um, and then you can understand what the warning signs are because it's just a manifestation. When there has to be a lot of selling of bonds and bonds don't give any good return, there's a guaranteed negative return in bonds relative to inflation. Inflation index bonds yield less minus 1%. And so there's no return And there's a pile of people who own bonds, and this isn't just Americans, but these are international investors owning bonds. And they have to buy a lot more bonds because when the government has to sell a lot more debt, that means they have to buy a lot more bonds, there will not be enough demand for those bonds. When that happens, interest rates rise, that's what you're seeing now, and the central bank is put in a dilemma. This is all classic end of cycle type of thing. The central bank is put into a dilemma because either interest rates will rise a lot or they will have to print money and buy those bonds to hold them down. When they print money and buy those bonds to hold rate down, that lowers real rates and it accelerates a depreciation of the value of the dollar and it also um, raises inflation pressures. And what the imbalance, the frightening thing about this is that if you get um, losing money and people are losing money by holding bonds, and that's not just Americans, those are other foreigners, then they could sell bonds. And if they sell bonds at the same time as the government has got to sell a lot of bonds, that could produce a real dilemma. That's classic late long-term debt cycle type stuff. So let's talk about Jay Powell's dilemma right now. You describe it as a dilemma. Uh, he, he appeared this week and basically took a, a hard look at the, at the debt market, at the treasury market, looked in the eye and said, I'm not gonna do anything to help you. Uh, and they didn't like it very much. And so the 10 year kept going. At what point is there enough pain and what form does that pain take? Is it really financial conditions tightening? I mean, does it have to get to be two and a half, three, three and a half, four? Well, as I said, <clears throat> think of, the economy as being um, like a, an individual in a, um, and their pulse is dropping. When the pulse is dropping, the doctors come running in with the stimulant and they inject stimulant. Now that the economy is rebounding he's, um, and inflation pressures are rebounding, um, there's not the same pressure to administer that stimulation. When it happens, when it becomes a problem, is first, the rising interest rates start hurting financial asset prices. First, typically, they hurt bonds. Then they pass through and hurt stocks because still, interest rates affect stocks. And when that starts to affect stocks, that's one thing. Maybe the stock market can correct 10 or 15% and the Federal Reserve can tolerate it. When it goes beyond that and starts to affect the economy, that's when you see the real trade-off have to search, uh, serve, uh, surface. So that's what that looks like. Okay, so let's play a little Dickens here and, and, and ask about the ghost of Christmas future. At the very end, they say, is this what has to be or can I still change it somewhat? Can we change it somewhat? And could Jay Powell specifically change it or for that matter, the, the administrative government? It's not an easy thing to change because what do you do? Spend less money 
And if you spend less money, you give less checks out, or you can't get people to easily earn more money and change that. So it's a difficult dilemma. And it's a particularly difficult dilemma that I think that you're going to see, particularly the part is the late this year and beyond that, because late this year, you're probably going to see um, everything um, be a problem. Um, you're going to probably see higher interest rates um, because growth will be stronger, inflation will be stronger, and that you'll see probably there won't be enough demand on it. So the thing to watch out for as a signal, if this happens, is that you see the need to uh, buy uh, bonds when the economy is strong and when inflation. If you take, um, there's this year and then there's beyond this year. There's, um, and there's the next few years. Um, it's a problem because how we're going to spend money is a political issue, a big political issue. And we're going to have to spend, and there's going to be too much spending. And so that'll affect the value of the dollar and or interest rates. Uh, Ray, as we speak, the Federal Reserve is buying something like $120 billion, both in treasuries and mortgage uh, bonds right now. How can you justify that when they came out and said we're going to have 6.5% GDP growth this year? The Federal Reserve uh, would say we're just going above their inflation targets, not by much. If you look at indicators like the break-even inflation rate, it's about two and a half percent, and they would say not yet. But the important thing to convey here on inflation is that there are two types of inflation. Okay, I just want to make this clear: we're used to one type of inflation, which is when the economy is too hot. Um, there's a capacity constraint, and when demand presses up against existing capacity, prices rise unemployment rates are low and so forth. There is a thing called a monetary inflation. That's when you can have stagflation. And that monetary inflation means that even when the economy weakens, inflation rates rise because there's too much inflation and there's the move out of that. So you're seeing the move out of bonds and, and cash to move into other assets like stocks and other investment assets, to some extent, stocks, gold, other currencies, Bitcoin and the like. Um, and, but you can start to see a monetary inflation. The real risk, the big risk is of a monetary inflation, which would come because there would be more sellers of bonds than there are buyers and the need for a lot of printing of money. So, so, Ray, you're recognized as one of the great investors of our age. Uh, so give us some investment advice here. Given what your analysis of how this works, what's going to happen, given where, what we're doing right now, what's the best investment? We heard Jamie Dimon just recently say he wouldn't touch a 10-year Treasury bond with a 10-foot pole. Well, I wouldn't touch a 10-year Treasury pole with a 10-year pole either. Um, um, cash is trash. In other words, you, it looks like a low risk in, uh, thing to hold, but it's not because when, you, because when you have a zero interest rate, or in some case in foreign countries, slightly negative interest rate, and you have an inflation rate of 2% or higher, you get taxed at a rate, essentially you lose buying power at a rate of about 2% a year, and that's a lot. You lose a lot of buying power. And so this is one of those environments you don't want to hold cash. If anything, maybe you bar borrow some cash and f find something that has better than a zero interest rate in it or, that, or something that has inflation. If you bought the average thing, which is inflating at 2% or more a year, you'd be better off. However, you uh, so then the other thing you need to do is diversify wealth, okay? So don't have cash and then you need diversification and the diversification should be currency diversification, country diversification, as well as asset class diversification.